Travis is so intense, he never gives up, and this guy's really got to be hurting. It's burning the candle at both ends and then blowtorch in the middle. Things start to fall apart if you keep going that way. Ten years ago, he was doing this very event. He got injured at World's Strongest Man, and we haven't seen him since, Danny. Well, it proved to be way too much for Travis Altmaier. Didn't have any repetitions under his belt. I get it a lot from people. They say I had the Kazmaier eyes. I think the intensity <laughs> kind of came down through my mother because she had that kind of intensity whenever I would do something wrong and she'd have a wooden spoon in her hand. And <laughs> Having that kind of genetic lineage for that intensity fueled by the amount of bullying that I had in middle school. I had been lifting weights since I was 11 and I think by ninth grade it started to show. I was definitely bullied less. In 10th grade, I don't think I was bullied at all. 11th grade, there was none. In 12th grade, I think people were afraid of me. I just kept steadily working. Every day after school, I'd go in the garage, I would hammer the weights, drink my disgusting protein shake that they had back in the 90s. <laughs> I had a friend who wanted to do the Texas State Championships and being his training partner, I was gonna go up and help him, but I remember saying to him, like, strong man, you mean like those guys on TV? What are you, crazy? We'll never be that strong. As we got there, he was signing in, and the promoter looked at me and says, hey man, why don't you sign up, you're here. So I says, you know, what the heck, I'll give it a shot. That's when my friend looked at me and said, man, I'm glad you signed up, because now, at least now I know I won't take last. And yeah, I didn't know I had a competitive bone in my body until that moment. That lit a fire that, <laughs> that took me in a new direction. It was 150 degrees out there, August 2nd, 2002, outside of a bank in Denison, Texas, right up on the border. But I remember feeling those events and smelling the tacky and feeling the stones in my arms every single night while I was dreaming for the next six months. It lit something up in me that I didn't know could be lit up. It was the most fun I'd ever had. I knew from that moment on, I was going to World's Strongest Man and I was headed there to win. By the way, I did beat him the next day. I took fifth in that first show and, and he did end up last. <laughs> I took that fire from that first competition. I took that passion that I, I felt and I ran with it. Within a few years, I was at Worlds doing my thing, having the time of my life. I think that rage burned bright for a long time. And then sometime around 2011, 2012, it kind of burned out. It is hard to get to that level and stay at that level for so long. And then with the injuries, especially that one in 2010, the broken ankle halfway through the final, it didn't heal very quickly. And I pushed way harder than it was ready to go. Ortmeier, a man with a great grip. I just wonder what in the heck's going on here. Why is he having so much difficulty? An ankle's not gonna heal when you're putting a thousand pounds on your back and walking on it. Hindsight being 2020, it's probably a bad idea. It's just kind of what we are as strong men. We're intense and pain is just another signal from the body. We can kind of tune it out. I had a doctor tell me that painkillers was the way to go. What you do, you kind of need them, is what I was told. Before I knew it, I was kind of stuck. This has been one of his signature events in the past. So aggressive, so efficient. Really finds the groove and just stays locked. What the? That's, the that's addiction to painkillers got worse and worse. And I had tried to quit a couple times. I had no guidance. I didn't know what to expect and that what I was feeling, feeling those withdrawals. I didn't know that that was normal. I didn't know that that's part of the process and you just gotta take it one step at a time. And a little side note about opiate addiction, it doesn't just numb the pain, it numbs your emotions. And that means you're numbing your relationships with those closest to you. On November 25th, 2012, I took my then wife and son, who had just turned three, to the airport to fly to England. My son happily carrying his backpack and his little race car suitcase, my wife holding his hand and walking out of my life. That moment shattered me. A friend offered me crystal meth. 
And I decided to just give myself a week, do whatever I needed to do to get away from that pain. That week turned into four years. At first, I kind of justified the use of the crystal meth because I didn't need the opiates. I didn't need the painkillers, and I was able to actually get off of these painkillers without any of the side effects, the withdrawals. And I thought in my brain, hey, I can always kick this one. This is no problem. I don't need it. And <laughs> I was just fooling myself. I traded one devil for another. That second one, that's a life destroyer. Opiates will mess your life up and cause some damage, but uh, crystal meth will absolutely destroy it. I was ready to give up. I was ready to throw in the towel. I was ready to be done. And to speak metaphorically, the devil came up to me and asked, are you ready to give up? And that's when I looked up at him and I said, I'm not done yet. And that's when I put the gun down. And I remember just kind of putting my head down, feeling a little bit defeated, and I could see my feet moving. And I thought, well, you know, my feet, they're a little messed up, but they still work. And that means I can get up and I can get out of this misery. I can walk right out of here. And I realized something that changed my life and has so much power in it, and it's so simple. I found something to be grateful for in a world of pain and misery and negativity and this endless cycle of looking at all the things that I'd lost and all the pain that I felt. Because I'd lost my family, I'd lost my friends, I'd lost my career, I'd lost my passion. And I had just been foreclosed on, so I was losing my house. And the moment I realized I needed to find something to be grateful for, it lit a new fire in me. And that gave me that little spark of joy for the first time in years. The next day, I remember I wanted to feel that again. And so I found another thing to be grateful for, and I kept it simple. I had my hands, so now I have my hands, I have my feet, and with that, I can get out of here and I can do anything that I want to. And the third day, I found a third thing. The fourth day, I found a fourth thing. On the fifth day, I didn't find a new thing, but I went through my previous four, and I had gratitude for each one of those. So now, rather than looking at the world and looking at all the negative things spiraling downward, I'm looking at all the little things and being grateful, and I started spiraling upward, and that's how I clawed my way out of that darkness. I remember in the darkness when I was just kind of pleading and asking and whining to myself, you know, when is this misery gonna end? And immediately from the depths of the back of my brain, this little voice popped up and said, you're gonna start over. My very first competition, I was 227 pounds. That one in August of 2002. The day I went back into the gym, I was 227 pounds. I had lost 100 pounds of body weight. <laughs> I ended up living in a storage unit for two months, and coincidentally, it was the same storage unit we used to train at for over 10 years. I would, you know, scrap or recycle stuff or find things that I could refurbish and then resell online. There was, there was always a tiny voice in the back of my head that said, we're, we're gonna go back to Worlds. It almost seemed impossible, but I took it one step at a time and I just kept climbing. I think it was maybe a little over a year, year and a half ago, when I started to break my old best numbers. I started to break my old records, and I became stronger than I had ever been. And that's when I really started to believe, like, you know, maybe, maybe all this fight, this belief is not for nothing. Maybe I really do have a shot at this. One of the things that probably helped me navigate the darkness and finally get out of it, and claw my way out of hell, was having that deep underlying purpose. And the underlying purpose was not just to get back to World's Strongest Man, but what it would mean if I got back to World's Strongest Man. It would mean you don't have to give up on life just because you've been knocked down. I'm here at 2021 World's Strongest Man for a lot of reasons, but there are two that stand out above all others. The first one 
is obviously I want to show everybody who's been kicked while they were down and had the world turn their back on him that it's up to them, it's up to you to get off the ground and make something of your life. The other reason I'm here, I want my son to see that his father is out there still fighting. Every time I'm lifting, every time I'm competing, every single day of my life, there's not a day that goes by I don't think about you, son. And I hope that you see me here at this competition and realize that you have climbed a massive hill, mountain, to get here and that you come from that same spirit. And I want you to realize that you've got all the strength in the world inside you. And I want you to know that your dad loves you. And I miss you every single day.